Every Sunday night, we are continuing our study on Revelation, and I've been in this book for 185, probably at least 185 weeks on Sunday night. And before I go into the book, and we have been studying in the book about the false prophet. And of course, the word false prophet is pseudo, P-S-E-U-D-O, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-E-S. Of course, it's a construction of pseudo, P-S-E-U-D-O. Pseudo is the word false and prophetes, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-E-S. And that's a false prophet. Now, false prophet, we, we've been talking about the uh, 13th chapter of Revelation. You've got, you've got two beasts and an image. That's what you've got in the, in the book. Now, I'm not going back through the first beast other than to say the first beast of Revelation 13 is, it is a, it's like a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and there has been a mistranslation in your English Bible every time a, a pronoun, him or his, possessive pronoun, uh, anytime it refers back to the beast, the beast in the second verse, the beast, of course, the beast is neuter gender, neuter gender, and any time you have a pronoun referring back to a noun, then what you've got to do is you've got to go to the, with the gender of the noun. And the noun is the beast or totherion in the Greek. Totherion. That is the word the. To is the word the. Therion is the word beast. And it is neuter gender. And we know that from the text because and whenever the Bible says the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority... Well, the, dragon, the word dragon is dracon. Now, one of the writers says that this word dracon has the idea of fascination, to fascinate, and that goes along with, that goes along with the word serpent in the third chapter in Genesis, the third chapter. The word serpent is the word nakash, and nakash comes from a word of the same spelling, means to enchant. Now, that's what a false prophet does. A false prophet makes people feel good. I listen to these preachers. I even listen to men who claim to be predestination preachers, people like R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, and they make the church feel good. They never make the church feel bad. I mean, uh, forget Charles Stanley. I mean, that man nails his foot to the floor and says nothing. And they don't believe in calling people's names either. You, we were talking about that at dinner. You can go into a primitive Baptist church and they be, preach predestination and they'll say, for whom he did foreknow. For whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate. He did predestinate and then they will put a period right there. Well, that's kind of like saying, uh, whom, uh, whom I knew, the person that I knew ran. We well, ran where? Well, he just ran. Well, did he run to the store? Well, he just ran. Well, did he run around the block? Well, he just ran. You cannot stop with a, with a verb, and that is a past tense verb with no, with an action verb, with nothing receiving the action of the verb, which is a direct object. You cannot have an action verb with nothing receiving the action of that verb. Direct object receives the action. And you can be in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, Primitive Baptist Church or Reformed Baptist, and they'll say, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And they'll talk about predestination. He didn't just predestinate. He predestinated them to be conformed. 
And Mike was raised in a primitive Baptist preacher's home. Mike's father was a primitive Baptist preacher. And Mike said he never, they would read once in a while to be conformed to the image of God's Son or to the image of, of Christ. And the word image is icon. But they never address to be conformed to the image of His Son. And most of them quote the verse down to predestinate. And they never, never talk about conforming to the image or the likeness of Christ. They never talk about that part. This part is left out. Most Reformed Baptists never even talk about that. And what makes us, if we're not in the image of Christ, that means we're in the image of ourselves. Isn't it? Remember we had two images? We had an image. You had an image to the beast. You had the first beast. You had the second beast. Two horns like a lamb. And it spake like a dragon. And that is the false teaching system. False teaching system. Because it looks like Jesus. And it speaks smooth words. It fascinates or it enchants. Now the way you can tell the false prophet from... It doesn't matter about the end of time. From the end of time all the way back to the beginning of time. The false prophet has always spoke smooth words and made everybody feel good. If you, if you feel good every time you go to church, there's something wrong with the preacher you're listening to. I preached a, a, a message years ago, about 12, 14, 15 years ago. It was called Doing Truth. And after I got through, we were a small congregation then, a lot smaller than now. One of the guys said, man, that makes me want to crawl out to my car and slither, slither up into the seat and try to see over the steering wheel and maybe try to drive myself home. He said, it made me feel so low. Well, that's what the Word of God is supposed to do to the sinful outer man that's in us. Well, then you had the third thing in that chapter. You have an image. You have an image of the beast. Well, the image of the beast, that's a likeness. It's the same word as predestined to conform to the likeness of Jesus. So, if a man has to be conformed to the image of Christ, when he first comes to a knowledge of Christ, he has to have some other image. And what is the image that he has before he comes into the image or the likeness of Jesus. He has the image of self, but he has the image of the beast. And that outer man that we have in us, there's an inner man, which is Christ in you, and an outer man. And that outer man was supposed to feel full, fulfill self. And self <coughs> is what the image of the beast is about, or the likeness of the beast, because it's a fascination and it makes one feel good, doesn't it? Now, people say, Jim Brown don't like any preachers. I don't like any of these guys living today that I know of. I like maybe one. Might, might, might find a couple or out there. Don't like Billy Graham. He doesn't tell the truth. He talks about accept Christ, pray the sinner's prayer, and that's not true. And he makes you feel good. He doesn't make you feel like the heel that you are, the worm that you are that Job said, Job said we are. Don't like Charles Stanley, he nails his foot to the floor and tries to be a marriage counselor. Just sits there and pops up and down doing like that. And I know, honey, that you know when you come home and say, honey, I know that you've had a hard day and, and I've had a hard day at the office. And you need to say, uh, dear, I know that we need to, I'd like to do things for you and I'd like to take you out to eat instead of... And he doesn't go into the... And when he reads the Bible, he departs from the text and never comes back to it. Now for years I... Had a tender spot for John MacArthur, but John, he's halfway predestination, halfway free will. He's got his Christ Mass, his Christmas. He's got his Easter, his Ishtar. He has his, uh, his water baptism. And he even made the statement himself. He said, if we baptize people the way we should, we'd put them under the water and we'd never let them up. Now, John said that. Well, John, what are you doing dipping people in water? If you know that's the meaning of the word, baptized means to cover, to stain with a dye. And a blood baptism was a death in the first century. Why are you doing that? 
I would like to sit down and talk with John. He's my age. I'd like to say, John, you're educated formally. I'm not. Let me tell you some things. You're not dealing with some things in life. He's got his pre-trib rapture, his premillennialism, and there's no foundation for any of that. People say, you don't like anybody. Well, I don't like the Church of Christ. I hate Pentecostal doctrine, the tongues, the, the, I hate the, the faith healing. There's no faith healing. That's not true. I've said this 5,000 times. Thy faith has made thee whole. The word whole is the word sozo, S-O-Z-O in the Greek. It, that's the word saved. That's the word, whether people like it or not. With the woman of the issue of blood, when Jesus said, Thy faith has made thee whole, go and be whole of thy plague. Well, that second word whole is not the word sozo. The second word whole is the word H-U-G-I-E-S. It means to be physically cleansed. Well, she wasn't physically cleansed because of her faith. She was made whole or sozo because of her faith. And since you can't come in contact with the living God, Jesus said, I'm going to heal you. But her healing had nothing to do with her faith. Her saving had to do with her faith. And every one of the verses don't say what the charismatics say they say. Don't like charismatic doctrine. You don't like anybody, do you, Jim Brown? The Baptists are lying, the Church of Christ are lying, the Methodists are a country club. I mean, they are really a country club. The Church of Christ are just some, they think they're off there by themselves and they are ignorant. They don't know what baptized means. All these people don't know what the words of, they do not know what the original text is. And I don't have time to go through all of it. I don't like them. Well... I'm not even supposed to like them. They're teaching false doctrine. You can't accept Christ. When you're a pile of dung out there in the field, and Paul said we're dung, he said, I mean, he said there's none good, not one, none understand, none seeks after God. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. There is none righteous, not one. And, and Job said all men drink iniquity like water. And who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? Not one. You can't clean yourself up by making a decision. You can't decide for Christ when you're dead. If He doesn't make you alive, quicken you, and birth you by His will, you're not coming alive. Are you? Our job is to preach, and the Word of God will do its work. It will not return void. Where are the invitation hymns? Where did they get that out of the Bible? It's not in the Bible. Invitations. Accept Christ, sinner's prayer. There is death to self. There's daily cross. There's self-denial. Well, Jim Brown don't like Billy Graham and Charles Stanley, and he didn't like Fred Price. Yeah, gosh, I guess not. Or Kenneth Copeland or Creflo Dollar or R.W. Schambach. He is a con artist. Or name him. I don't like him. Joel Osteen is going to die in his sin and go to hell. That man is wicked to the core. He is so well liked by the, uh, the world. And the Bible says, if you're friends with the world, you are an enemy of God. Whoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. He don't do nothing but stroke you and rub you down with oil and make you feel wonderful. Well, who do you like? I like this man right here, Thomas Watson, but he's long dead. He's a Puritan writer. I love this man, John Bunyan. These guys, you read them and they cut you to the heart. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Man, that's a great book, but here's acceptable sacrifice. This will break your heart. Make you feel like the biggest worm in the world. Here's a Thomas Watson book. Religion, Our True Interest. Here's another Watson book, one of my favorite books of all time. All things for good. Boy, that will hurt you. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Here's another Bunyan book on prayer. I like these guys. I love these guys. And here's a modern day man. He's a pastor's a little church up in Pennsylvania. Shadow of the cross. He doesn't cut any slack for any preacher's. Let me just read some excerpts out of Walter Chantry's book. There's not many men out there that's saying anything that's true. I'll just read it. 
Now, we're talking about false prophets. The world is full of false prophets. Let me read a couple of things here. Some who call themselves Christian, in fact, have never taken up their crosses, being ignorant of the experience of self-execution, of self-denial. They are of necessity strangers to Christ. Did you hear that? If you, do, or if you are not familiar and you are ignorant of self-execution, you have to take sides with God against you and execute yourself. I'm not talking about getting a gun and going out here and shooting yourself in the head. Some people, one guy came here and he said, well, well what do y'all, a blood baptism, what do y'all dip people in blood? A blood baptism was a martyrdom in the first century. When you tell people the truth, you'll go through that. And he's saying, you are a stranger to Christ. This is what Walter Chantry says. You are no friend of Christ if you, do, if you have not executed yourself. If you don't know what no self-denial is. Well, Jim, can you back that up? Yes, I can. Luke 14, 27. If you do not bear your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Don't you think it's important to find out what a cross is? I guess so. Let me read a couple more excerpts from Walter Chantry's book. The demand of bearing a cross is universal. It is made of all who follow Christ without exception. No exceptions to a daily cross. None. Oh, you mean I can't just walk down the aisle and say, I'd like to accept Jesus as my Savior and never pick up my Bible but carry it to church and look good? If you are a spiritual being... And you, if you claim to be a spiritual being, put it that way, and you have no hunger for this book and find out what it means, you do not know God. You can't know God because if you're any kind of a being, you're going to be hungry for the food that nourishes that kind of being that you are. Aren't you? Are you, does anybody here ever get hungry for food? Does anybody ever want to go home and cook or go to a restaurant or stop and pick up a snack of any kind in your life? Has anybody here ever wanted to eat? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I wonder why. You think, well, did you have to be convinced to eat? Somebody have to say, now look, come on, look, come on, accept this food, come on, take this hamburger, please take it. I know you haven't eaten in 36 years, but take it please. Nah, never wanted hamburgers, but I tell you what, I know I'm alive. That's exactly what it's like to say, I have no hunger for the Word of God, but I'm a Christian because I got saved one night. No, you're not. Jesus said, if you do not forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Is that a hard word? Forsaking all things or you can't be a follower of Christ? What does that mean? I'm not saying when you're young you'll do that all of a sudden. Because you're not going to do it all of a sudden. But you will do it. And you're going to want some kind of milk of the word. You cannot have a hunger. You cannot know Christ. Let me read a little more. Of what Mr. Chantry says. I wrote this in. I, I love this so much. Uh, listen to this. Our Lord addressed these words to all. Not to a select few. Who walked nearer to Christ. I used to think the Beatitudes were for a special breed of believers. That's for every one of us. We have to be poor. In spirit. Emptied out. We have to be meek. And tamed down by God. I love this statement. I wrote it in one of the tracts over here. I hope Mr. Chantry will forgive me of that. It is an absolute impossibility to be a Christian without self-denial. It's impossible. Now, these kind of words hurt, don't they? You say, oh, me. Evangelists have failed even to mention that Christ insists upon denial of self at the onset, having failed to pass on our Lord's requirement and forgetting it themselves, evangelists have never questioned whether their converts with self-centered lives are true followers of Christ. 
You mean a man, his life is self-centered, don't deny self, and he's a follower of Christ because he accepted Christ one night. You can't accept Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Receiveth is that word decomai, and it means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been given. Dead men do not accept anything spiritual. God has to make you alive with His Word. All you have to do is preach to somebody. And anytime you're talking to somebody out in public, tell them, I'm not trying to convert you or sell you anything. If you can't hear what I hear, you will die and go to hell one day. You are a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. I won't convince you of a thing. If the Holy Spirit can't convince you, I certainly will not try. I'm not going to give you an invitation. I'm going to ask you to join anything. We don't ask anybody to join anything or fill out any cards. And I don't have any idea how many people have come through Grace and Truth Ministries. have no idea. Probably several thousand. Assuming that it is possible for a man... Listen to this. This is Mr. Chantry. Assuming that it is possible for a man to be self-indulgent and yet heaven-bound... Bible teachers look for some way to bring egocentric men to a higher spiritual plane. Egocentric men. Remember the word I in the Greek? The word I is E-G-O. That's the word I. I. Well, like Mr. Chantry says, you can't be looking. You're supposed to crucify I. Those who save texts demanding a cross for the deeper life have cheated their hearers in evangelism. They call that a deeper life? No, no. Without the cross, you're not going to heaven. You have to have a daily cross, not the wooden cross that Jesus bore. He did bear a wooden cross. But there's a daily cross. If any man will come after me, Luke 9, 23... Let him deny himself. That's not a special breed of believers. Remember the word deny? A-P-A-R-N-E-O-M-A-I. We're talking about false doctrine as opposed to true doctrine or pure doctrine. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself without self-denial. But when he put the word... Deny, the common word is arneomai. It means to contradict. And when he put this word apo on there, that's a complete, a total setting off or removal of self. There has to be a total contradicting. And then he said, let him deny. Let him is not in the text. It just, it just says, deny, take, follow. And that word arneomai means to contradict. Up arneomai means to totally contradict yourself. How do you do that? You can't do it, but you have to. And if God doesn't work in you to will and to do of His good pleasure, you won't do it. If He doesn't deal in a man's heart... And it won't be something you do. It won't be a walk down the aisle. It's not going to be accept Christ and pray a sinner's prayer because there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer. All you have to do is tell somebody the truth. And it will. the Holy Spirit, if they're elect, will cut into their heart and they will believe. Isn't that amazing? I just said the magic word, believe. And yet everybody wants to work all around this false doctrine Works all around it and comforts people. Come down in the aisle and pat him on the head and pat him on the hand. There, there, brother, God bless you. Would you like to pray this prayer? And the Bible says, I know the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that's not the method of salvation. Read the next verse, verse 14. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How are you going to start praying to a God you don't believe in? And belief is the method of salvation. But when you believe something in the first century, you were obedient to it. And that's what these Puritan writers taught. And that's Mr. Chantry. I love his, this work. It's just a great book. Let me read a little more of this. Listen to this from Walter Chantry. Those who save 
texts or certain verses that demand a cross for the deeper life have cheated their hearers in, in evangelism. Without a cross, there is no following Christ. Well, there ain't many. He's two years older than me. There ain't many preachers in the world today that'll say that, is there? Without a cross, no following Christ. Do you think it's important to find out what a cross is? When, the, when Jesus himself said in Luke 14, 27, if you don't bear your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. That ought to make you check out your heart, shouldn't it? And that's why the elect are always checking their hearts. And without following Christ, there is no life at all. So he's saying, you don't have eternal life if you're not following Christ. And you don't have eternal life without self-denial and without a daily cross. Because when he said, let a man deny himself, up or Naomi, and take up his cross. Take up cross. That word take is an imperative command. It's the word arrow, A-I-R-O. It, it is a command. Denies the command. These are commands from the living God. He's not inviting you to do this. He's giving you ears to hear and he's demanding. What I'm trying to get over to you is the difference between a true preacher of the gospel and a false preacher of another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. And the false prophet's always been the same. An impression has been given that many enter life through a wide gate of believing on Jesus. That's Walter Chantry. They, they preach that men can enter and have life through a wide gate while they believe in Jesus. The wide gate is for the many that go to destruction. The narrow gate is for few that find life. Then a few go through the narrow gate of the cross for a deeper spiritual service. That is not true. That's what he's saying. On the contrary, the broad way without self-denial leads to destruction. All who are saved have entered the fraternity of the cross. And the cross is a brotherhood, isn't it? And that's what really bothers us so much because we're always carrying our cross. And what is a cross? A cross was an execution in the first century for criminals and slaves. And you had to be condemned to a cross. And the way you're condemned to a cross is for telling the people the truth that Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan and predestination is true and free will is a lie. Christ's summons to a cross is perpetual. Self-denial is not an initiation fee. That's daily. Once paid, forever, and forgotten. It's not an initiation fee. It's a daily requirement. Old Christians, as well as new converts, must bear a cross. One's cross is not a disposable item of Christian experience, but a lifelong burden in this world, isn't it? How many of y'all come to me and say, Oh, Jim... And you're groaning and you're saying, oh me, this is so hard. You know what you're doing when you're groaning like that? You're going through the straight and narrow way. Straight is the gate. Straight is the gate. And this is what true doctrine is. That's why I don't like these guys that don't make you hurt. They say, well, brother... God wants to save you this morning. We're just going to sing another verse of just as I am. And as we sing, we're going to whisper into the microphone and caress the microphone and make you feel kind of comforted and good. And all you have to do is come down here. We're going to pray this prayer. And you can accept Christ and commit your heart to Jesus and not feel too bad about it. And tomorrow you can kind of go out and live your life and say, well, I've became a Christian and it doesn't matter. Uh, we know that you're a sinner and God understands your sin. You don't have to feel too guilty. You just got to feel good about it. That's not the truth. Each one of you here and myself included if God doesn't cut us to the heart, we do not know him. One's cross is not a disposable item of Christian experience. For a true believer, the cross is ubiquitous. That means it's everywhere in your life. 
lifelong, a daily weight. I love this statement. I use this statement in one of my tracks. There is but one depository of the cross. That is the cemetery. You cannot put it down till the day you die if you belong to Christ. Is it important to find out what a cross is? If you have no hunger for the word, how are you going to have a cross? Because if you have no hunger for the word, you're never going to say anything to anybody that's going to be offensive enough for them to want to kill you. Oh, they may not do it literally, but they'll do it figuratively, won't they? How many of us have family members that have cut off from us from telling the truth? My daughter, I hadn't seen her in 21 years. She's 46 years old. I hadn't seen her. I've got a grandson about 22 years old. Last time I saw him, he was about six or eight weeks old. She doesn't want anything to do with what I'm saying. I ain't taking her Christmas away from her. She ain't going to leave this predestination. My mother doesn't want it. My older brother doesn't want it. My sister, who I was as close to as you can possibly be to a sibling, does not want this. To say my younger brother doesn't want it, he's a heathen. We shall not carry the pain of self-denial in the celestial city. But our Lord holds out no hope that the cross will cease to afflict us in this life. We're going to be condemned the longest day we live. If you're not hungry, you know what you get to a place where you're hungry for the cross. It is daily for any man. You must ask yourself, am I bearing a cross today? You say, I'm too young. I haven't learned that yet. If you belong to Christ, if you're elect and you can hear these words, I don't care how young you are, you will one day bear your cross. And if you're a adult and you don't... And you don't ever offend anybody. And all you do is buddy and pal around with people. And you never offend them. There's something wrong with your believing life. Because you must have a cross before this life is over. Sometimes it takes God, oh, a lot of years to beat you in the head with a ball bat about 400,000 miles long. And then he crushes you one day and you say, and you're broken and you're in the hospital dying like I've been. And you say, Lord, I'm ready to do what I'm supposed to do. As has been suggested, the cross is painful. It's painful to make your family angry that you love so much that they don't want to have anything to do with you. Isn't it? The term cross has lost all significance If the element of dreadful suffering is taken away, it has no significance if it doesn't hurt. Yeah, but you don't understand, Jim. My family don't want to hear this. Well, neither does mine. Neither does Gerald's. I mean, neither does Mary's. Neither does Fred's. (laughs) Neither does Jim and Barbara's. They walked away from three kids and grandkids and Fort Wayne, four kids and grandkids and said, we're going to Tennessee and we're moving there. For the truth, they said, can't you find a church here in town? No, not one that's telling the truth. Taking the cross. Let me read a little more on this. There's a cross to bear on the best days as well as on the worst. You may bear a cross unseen by all but your heavenly Father. The deepest pains of the cross are not publicly visible. Boy, they hurt me inside so bad sometimes. I go through two or three weeks saying, man, I wish I could see my mother. But last time I talked to her, every time I talked to her, she says, I don't want to hear that. And she was a Baptist preacher's wife. And she played the piano and organ for 55 years. But she don't want to hear this. I want so bad to call Janice and talk to her, my sister. But I can't talk to her about three. Jimmy, why can't you just come back home and we'll talk about our wallpaper and when we went on vacation, what kind of car we're buying. Let's be all be friends like we used to be. No. I, I live in this 24 hours a day. All of y'all should know that that's been around me any amount of time. I have given away probably several thousand tapes, videos, and audios in Hendersonville myself 
I carry sacks of, of DVDs with me and tapes. And I give them away to the waiters and the waitresses and the people in the restaurants and, and people down at the supermarket and down at the department store. My doctors, I take them in my doctors. I give them to the nurses. And I challenge them to listen to them. And I try to tell them what's on the tapes. I say, now you're not going to like me after you hear this. Oh, I'll always like you, Jim. You're such a uh, gentle person. I know you won't. You're either going to love me or hate me once you watch one of my videos. Because I'm not a nice guy when it comes time to preach. And they look at me kind of funny. Taking up your cross is an intentional act. That's not something you accidentally stumble into. You fully intend to tell somebody the truth. You know how you have to do that when you first start off? You have to make yourself do it. I put myself under an obligation. I carry several tapes when I go into a department store. I say, I'm going to try to give away one of these anyway. I stuff my pockets full. I'll have DVD. I stick them under my arm, two or three of them. Say, I'm going to try to get rid of these to people in here. In every passage which records our Lord's mention of a cross for his disciples, he commands them to take it up. And that's not an invitation. There are great afflictions of God's people which are imposed by providence. Providence, we think of the sovereignty of God. The word providence comes from the word provide. God has provided the daily cross for us. He's provided the fiery trials and afflictions for us. Irresistible sufferings may be the hand of chastisement or refining mercy. These are trials, but not crosses. Did you hear that? Irresistible sufferings. That's where you just can't keep from suffering because somebody's giving you a hard time. Some guy's cheating you out of some money or somebody sent you something through the mail that you didn't order and you can't get them to take it back and you can't get your money back and or your insurance agent overcharged you something and that you can't get your refund back or a brother-in-law cheated you out of, your, out of a car and won't pay you the rest of the money on a car he bought from you or a boat or some guy next door is doing some giving you a hard time because your limb is hanging over his fence and, and he cuts your tree down and you're mad and you want to go and sue the guy. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not a cross. Are you behind on your house note? That's not a cross. That's what he's saying. Irresistible sufferings Maybe the hand of chastisement or of refining mercy. God may be whipping you, picking up evil men in his hand. And David said, deliver me from the wicked which is thy sword. And God said, I'll, I'll hit you with this evil man if you're not behaving yourself. These are trials, but not crosses. Ooh we. Crosses are intentional. It's you telling people the truth and being hung on a cross for it. A cross must be taken up by the one whose self is to be denied painfully. This is a painful operation. You understand that? The taking up of a cross is mortal. It is deadly. Death on the cross may be very slow, but a cross has one objective. Here's the objective of the cross. I love these words right here. It ruthlessly intends to bring death to self. Two parallel ideas in verses 23 and 24 show that our Lord has this in mind. Let him deny himself. Put to death self-importance. Self-satisfaction. Self-absorption, self-advancement, self-dependence. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, that's it. Hmm. This man's heart is me. Who are we? You don't want to read this book. This will break your heart. Death to self-interest because you serve Christ's honor. Every capitulation of those things which men call legitimate interest for God's glory. As those hard words, if only the cross were understood, many complaints would be silenced which murmur against God's providence. 
There is no satisfying communion with the Most High without a cross. Good as I could read on with this man. Now, you don't know who I like? I like this man. What must a Christian do if he is to witness? He must consciously choose words that pain his own social conscience and that, that, that love of peace in him. It's going to pain you because you love peace. You want to get along with these friends. Get along with your job. You don't want to lose your clientele. You don't want to lose the people that come to you. It's going to be painful. You have a love of peace. Guys, that reminds us of Ezra the ninth chapter, doesn't it? The Lord commands Israel, do not intermarry with these pagans because it, what you're doing is you're seeking their peace and their wealth. You want their money, and the only way you can get it is you have peace with them and get along with them. And that's what we want, isn't it? We want to get along so we can get money from them. That's what it's about. What must a Christian do to be a witness? He must consciously choose words that pain his own social conscience and love of peace. He must purposely drive the wedge between self and fellow workers deeper. I don't think I've said harder words than this. There are no easy steps to witnessing. No painless, unembarrassing methods. You must bring men to see that they are filthy sinners under the wrath of God who must flee to Christ for mercy. That is offensive. And there is no way to coat it with honey. That's a good writer. You want to know what preacher I like? He's still alive. He's two years older than me. I like him. Didn't sound like Billy Graham, did it? Huh? Never heard him say things like that. Goodness, I wish I... I Thomas Owens, I mean, John Owen, great writer. Puritan. I thought Puritans were some real stuffy people when I was in elementary school the first time I heard about them. They're far from stuffy. They'll cut your heart with hard words. Great book. Excellent book by Thomas Watson. I'll read some of, the, some of this along the way. Acceptable Sacrifice by John Bunyan. Great book in anything you can get by Thomas Watson. John Bunyan, wonderful writer. This man spent 12 years. This is a man who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He spent 12 years in prison for preaching the doctrines of predestination that I preach here. 12 years. They didn't like that. And you know what? People would stop me if they could. Religion of Interest, Thomas Watson. I've got a dozen books by him. Gleanings from Thomas Watson. He says some hard things in here. How much time do I have, Mike? One of my favorite all-time books, All Things for Good, by Thomas Watson. Thomas Watson is my favorite all-time writer. I love Jonathan Edwards. I like Charles Spurgeon. But this man, he knows how to cut you to the heart. He says some hard, hard words. He's talking about our love towards God. And he's, I read a lot of this. He talks about our love towards God. Our love must be sincere. Grace be with all of them that love our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, the one, the one loved his person, the other loved his gifts. He said, some love, he's talking about, we love Christ, as Augustine says, for himself. As we love sweet wine for its taste. The one loves, loved his person, the other for his gifts. Many love God because he gives them corn and wine. Or he gives them gifts. That's what the charismatics love of God for, isn't it? And not for his intrinsic excellences. We must love God more for what He is than for what He bestows upon us or what He gives to us. True love is not mercenary. This is Mr. Watson, all things for good. You need not hire a mother to love her child. You don't have to do that. A soul deeply in love with God 
needs not to be hired by reward. If you love God, you'll love him if he crushes you and takes everything you've got. And he says, we can never love God as he deserves, as God's punishing us is less than we deserve. In Ezra 9, 13, so our loving him is less than he deserves. Isn't it? Love to God is, love to God is peculiar. He who is a lover of God gives him such a love as he bestows upon none else. You, if you love God is what he's saying here. You love God more than your wife, more than your husband, more than your kids. And you'll tell your wife and your husband and your family and your kids, I've got a love that's greater than you. And he has commanded me to love him to tell you the truth. Now, I know you won't do that all of a sudden, but you have an obligation to do that somewhere in your life. As God gives his children such a love as he does not bestow upon the wicked, electing, adopting love. A wife, a spouse to one husband gives him such love as she has for none else. As wicked men are constant in love to their sins, neither shame nor sickness nor fear of hell will make them give over their sins. No fear makes a man give up his sins. We must love God. I like this. Boy, this is hard, folks. This is Thomas Watson, All Things for Good. We must love God more than relations. You know what that's talking about? More than your kin, folks. You have to love God. And if you love God, what is it that you do? Now, these are hard words. You talk about the difference between false teachers and true teachers. If you love God... You agape God, don't you? Huh? Yes. Now, you got two words for love. You have the word agape. Agape and phileo. Those are not words of love. Those are just two words in the Greek language that have been translated over to L-O-V-E. Well, phileo is not agape and agape is not phileo. Phileo is the word that we always use to like to like or have affection for. Well, we have the word friend from that. Friends. Friend. Which is the word philia, P-H-I-L-I-A. And that's a derivative of this word phileo. Well, agape, that was a relation between a king and his subjects. Or a father and his family. A father and his family. And John says, first, 2 John 6, this is love. This is agape. That we walk after his commandments. Now, here's what true love to God is. God is love. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. It's always agape. And that is walking in a commandment of God. If you're not walking... But wait a minute. Didn't we say that deny, take, follow... Deny and take and follow are all imperative moods in the Greek... An imperative mood is a command. You do not love God at all if you do not deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Akulatheo. If you are not in the same way with. If you're not in the same way with Christ. Well, what's the way? It's narrow. Narrow is the word philebo. Philebo. It means, it comes from the word philipsis. And that's the word tribulation from one end, to the, uh, one end of the New Testament to the other in the Greek text. 
If you're not going through tribulation, you don't know God. If you're not walking in His commandments, you have no love. The amount of love you have for God, but I'm nice and humble and, and I love God. No, that's no sign that you love God because you're humble in this world to men. You cannot humble yourself to God and man at the same time. It's impossible. Isn't it? Yes. T-A-P-E-I-N-O-O. Now, we're talking about the difference between true doctrine and false doctrine. False doctrine is mushing it. We love Jesus and, and just thank God for, I know that you've got a difficult time in life. And, you know, the Bible says Jesus came that we might have life more abundantly. And God wants you to have an abundance of life. As we uh, gather here in America and you have your job and God wants you to have abundance and he wants you to have good health and God wants you to, uh, to uh, prosper along in life and God wants to walk with you daily. You don't feel any guilt about that, do you? That's mush. That's nothing. I watch TV preachers and it's just, I don't know how to talk that way if I don't write it down because the truth keeps slipping in there. All of a sudden, I'm saying, and God wants you to repent. And I'm going, wait a minute. I didn't mean to say it. I'm trying to imitate these guys. <laughs> so whenever, anytime you find an imperative mood, humble means to level self. Well, how can you humble and level self to men and, and say, I'm real humble Gosh, I like you. I, I, I really love you. And you never use plainness of speech. You never tell them about a daily cross. You never tell them about self-denial. You never tell them about death to self. You never tell them about mortifying the deeds of the flesh. You don't talk about we must through much tribulation in the kingdom of God. You don't say any of the words of Paul that he says to all the churches that we have to be distressed and cast. We, we're not cast down. We're depressed. You, you never read, preachers never read words. These preachers today are the false prophet. You don't hear them read, look. This is not hard. Why is it I can find, in a King James Bible, I can find, how is it I can find verses like this? And Baptist preachers, and Church of Christ, and Pentecostals can never find these verses. Let me just read to you. 2 Corinthians, 4th chapter. How is it I can find this and they can't find it? I'm talking about the false teacher as opposed to the true preacher of God. This mush and slush. Well, Jim, you're just not out there and you don't. How do you know what all these preachers do? I have traveled all over these United States and preached in churches all over America. And God had to deal with me and make me quit going out there and try to get along with those guys. And they're all full of slush and mush. I never had one good conversation in California, in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Florida, the Carolinas, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and I preached in all those places and more, and I ever, never had one intelligent conversation with one preacher. That's saying a lot, isn't it? I, I just got disgusted. They just backslapped me. When you're a young preacher back in the 60s, it was, <laughs> well, God bless you, son. Well, amen, well, praise God. <laughs> That's all I got from them. Has anybody ever seen a preacher do that? Yes. Well, hell, amen. Well, praise the Lord, young man. Well, it's good to have you here uh, to preach this little three-day revival for us. Well, amen. That made me want to kick him right in the shin. Say, quit that. That's condescending. That's proud. That's arrogant. Well, he was arrogant. He's proud. And then they'd start bragging on some building program. And I'd try to get in conversations with them all the time I was there in a revival. I couldn't get them to talk about Paul or even mention his name, much less Jesus. Have you ever tried to get a preacher to talk to you about the Bible? Have, have you ever noticed how difficult it is to talk Scripture? 
because he doesn't know enough, he's going to be embarrassed if he gets in a conversation with you. If you think these guys know things, they don't. Most people think, well, my pastor knows a lot. He's got a doctor's degree from this seminary up here, and he's smart. He just don't ever say those real smart things out loud. But Jim Brown, he could really set you straight. And he never says them in the pulpit. We don't hear him say them in private or at any gatherings or parties or dinners at the church. When nobody's ever heard him say them. Boy, he has to be smart because he graduated with a doctor's degree. And boy, he's really straightened you out. The guy's a moron. You hadn't figured that out? They go to schools, get these degrees to stand in the pulpit and say slush so you give them 150000 a year. That's why they do that. It's a cushy job. Let me tell you, I'm 67, and I wasn't born yesterday or the day before. I know they don't know nothing. Now, you might not know that yet, but I already know it. I'll corner a preacher in a, I mean, in a heartbeat if I catch one in an office somewhere. Caught one in an office across town one day, he's going. That's all he could do. I was just going. He's going, uh, uh. Oh, well, brother, it's good to meet you. <laughs> they don't even know how to quote a verse. They know John 3, 16, Genesis 1, 1, Ephesians 2, 8, and that's about it. Huh? Second Corinthians. Let me just read. Look here. I'm talking about false prophets. False prophets have always been the same thing. Look here. Let's just read here. Now, this is what you're supposed to go through. Verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always, every day, bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our physical bodies. Well, you don't hear preachers read that, do you? And comment on it. For we which live for Christ is the implication are always delivered unto death. How about daily? For Jesus' sake, that the life also of Christ, Jesus, might be made manifest in our mortal bodies. That's not the change. Christ has to come alive in our mortal flesh, doesn't he? Yeah. If he don't come alive in you, and if he comes alive, you're going to go through these things. So then, death worketh in us, the apostles, but life, so that you might come to life. I'm going to travel all over the world and go through every kind of tribulation you can imagine for you. A lot of times people say, Jim Brown's mad at us. I ain't mad at the sheep. I'm over here and I've said this 10,000 times. I'm over here going to sheep. Are you all okay? When people see me out of the pulpit, they think, boy, you're not as mean out of the pulpit. That's because I'm attacking all these wolves. I'm going, sheep, are you okay, Gerald? Are you all right, Fred? Okay, little sheep. Now, I'm not as strong as some of you guys, but I'm still an old, I'm about seven feet tall. Even uh, Tony that comes, six foot seven Tony that went to eat with us today, he'll come up to me and say, I know I'm a baby, Jim, and he is. Great big guy. Looks like he belongs in the NFL. He was trying to play in the NFL at one time. And he'll say, I'm just a baby. And he'll come down, lean over to me and ask me questions. And I'm over here hovering and say, Tony, you okay? I got to take care of some sheep. Hold on. I got to take care of some wolves. Get out of here. And I will attack these wolves. What I'm doing is protecting you. Now... I know this hurts us, and it's supposed to. Look back in the first chapter of this, of this book. The first chapter. And Paul is, when Paul talks to the Corinthians, man, he says some hard things. Second Corinthians, the first chapter. He says here, in the first chapter, 
For we, we would, verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, of our philipsis. T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. That's the word tribulation. We wouldn't have to have you ignorant of our tribulation. This is what the truth does. It puts us in tribulation. Without any tribulation, tribulation comes for telling the truth. No such thing as a person be a Christian believer without tribulation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our tribulation, which came on us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. Now, pressed out is the word boreo, B-O-R-E-O. comes from boros, which means a heavy load. Boros means a heavy load. It means to weigh down with a burden excessively heavy. We were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. That word despaired, even of life, is the word exapoiomai. E X. A-P-O-R-E-O-M-A-I. Aporeomai means in a quandary with no way out. When you put exaporeomai, it means to be utterly at a loss. Paul said, I have been in places where I did not know what to do. Oh God, if you don't deliver me from this, I can't stand it another day. Does this sound like Billy Graham? Huh? Thank you. You don't sound like Charles Stanley, does it? I'm just reading to you out of the Bible. This is, when you go to the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about some preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. I'm trying to compare, and I'm going to stay on Revelation. I'm going to stay on the false prophets. Most people think a false prophet is going to rise one day and be some growling... Something that looks like Dracula with a big collar, a big, big uh, Elvis collar on with a, bat, with a widow's peak and he's growling and spewing fire. That's not, it's not a false prophet. False prophets have to deceive the very elect if it were possible. They have to be so good. Are these guys in these pulpits good? I mean really good at doing what they do. I don't even know how to do what they do. You have to practice that and learn that. That is a learned attitude is what it is. You have to learn to do that. And I can't do it. I have to write it down because if I'm trying to talk to you like a false teacher, I have to go real slow and pretend because, boy, truth will creep right into my words. I can't keep it out. They, that's a gimmick they learn. It's just like some woman that walks sexy all the time. That's a gimmick she learned. Y'all women know that, don't you? She learned that. Somebody taught her that. And she's trying to seduce men all the time. That's a learned thing. I mean, Cindy Crawford was somebody's scrawny big sister one time that was at home and her and, my, and her little brother would say, Mama, Cindy got the last cookie. She said, I did not. And her hair is in curlers, you know. That's who Cindy Crawford actually is. I don't know if y'all know that. That's who all those people are. That's who all we are. We're just people. And they think you think they're special. Look here, Second Corinthians 11. Now, here is the results. Here's the results. Uh, bring a true preacher of the gospel. Was Paul a true preacher? Did, was he a preacher of truth? Yes, yes sir. Here is the results. There were some false teachers coming, he said, in chapter 11. And they were corrupting minds. And he says, would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you, Corinthian church, to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, as the nakash, 
as the enchanting one beguiled Eve. That was the first false preacher. That was the first false prophet. And every false prophet has been the same ever since. And he whispered and said, Eve, the Bible doesn't really mean what it says. Predestinate doesn't mean predestinate. Don't you know that's unreasonable in an American society? It doesn't mean that. God wants everybody to be as God's. God doesn't mean it when he says thou shalt not. He understands your sin. You know what the attitude of people because they hear the message they hear? As the servant beguiled Eve through his subtlety, through his trickery, panogia is the word, P-A-N-O-U-R-G-I-A, P-A-N-O-U-R-G-I-A, panogia, means trickery, subtlety. It means he's diverted Eve from the truth by his smooth talk and she don't think anything bad's going to happen to her. And when these preachers preach, they divert people's attention away from the truth with smooth talk and they never read these verses that I'm reading, do they? What is a true preacher of God in order to find a false teacher? False teachers are smooth talkers. I was listening to... Mr. Smooth Talk himself, going home today from the restaurant. D. James Kennedy. Just boringest man alive. And just talking about just... And he was saying things. I'm sitting there arguing as we're going down the road. That's not true. And I'm just sitting there just wanting to yell at the... Said something. I can't remember what it was. Just he says the stupidest things that have no foundation... And, I'm, and you talk about smooth and making you feel good and just very boring as he talks this way. And we know and we realize and he said, and God this and God that. And I'm going, and he doesn't even, and he puts things in there that's not in the Bible. And he doesn't use plainness of speech. And everybody says, boy, we had a wonderful, boring message this morning, didn't we? I mean, it bores me to no end. Now he says... I fear less by any means. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds, your noema. Here's the false teacher. It all goes back to the garden, doesn't it? It's all about the tree, isn't it? Subtility is always about the tree. False doctrines about the tree. It's always about the tree. It's about nothing but the tree. And the tree is 1 John 2, 16, 17. John said, all that is in the world. When you think of all that's in the world, what do you think of? Well, you think of cars, houses, Youth, feel good, jewelry, vacations, money, IRAs, investments, good retirement. Good retirement. And we can go on and on. Cars. Fancy cars. Image. Uh, applause. It's like what Mr. Chantry said. If you don't have... If you don't execute yourself to self-advancement, to self-desires... If you don't cease to think about yourself and think of others and not yourself. Somewhere in your life. You have to start saying, Lord, I don't count. What counts is everybody in the church except me. Well, goodness. Wouldn't that be great if everybody thought that way? You got ten people in a circle. And everybody in the circle is told, do not think about yourself. Look out for the things of everybody else. You got eleven people looking out for you instead of one 
looking out for you, don't you? And if Christians came to that point, we've got one another to look to, don't we? But nobody likes a smart aleck, do they? Nobody likes a know-it-all, and a know-it-all is looking out for himself. Isn't that it? Nobody likes that. Did you know people out in life don't even like each other for that? Nobody likes it when somebody just looks out for number one. Somebody wants to make themselves number one. Nobody. That's disgusting, isn't it? Where was I? Okay. Back over here. Now, the false prophet began in the garden. Isn't that where he started? Huh? And he says that your minds should be corrupted. Minds corrupted. Now, that's a good word. Mind corrupted. The word there, corrupted, is the word phthero or diaphthero. That your minds are corrupted. Let me give you a couple of things here. Your mind's corrupt. Now, when your mind's corrupt, the word is phthero, P-H-T-H-I-R-O, P-H-T-H-I-R-O. This is what happens, this is what happens with false doctrine. Your minds are corrupted. The word phthero means to waste or shrivel or to rot. Your noema, your thinking, is rotten. Your thinking is rotten when you're, when you're given smooth words. You can't think right. You really don't know what's right. We were talking at dinner today, and one of the ladies said, well, I used to go to church, and, and, and I'd listen, and I'd... I couldn't make any sense of it. Maybe it was Marcy. I couldn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to me. I'm going, what is this? This is making me want to get up and scream and run out of the church. When you're elect and you have the word of God written on fleshy tables of the heart, you can't stand that mush. You have a resentment to it because there is a truth written in your heart and you know this is something wrong here. And sometimes, and most of us, when we went to those churches... Now, I have a little edge on all of y'all. I've been preaching in churches all over the country since I was uh, 24, 25 years old. So I knew they were wrong a long time ago. But you have a tendency to think there's something wrong with you, don't you? And there was nothing wrong with you. You were elect, and the rest of that church there, and that preacher in particular was not elect. You say, how in the world can you say a Baptist preacher can go to hell? Well, how could Jesus say the Pharisees, the most righteous men of their day, the most highly regarded religious men of the day, were children of hell? Jesus himself said, you will know the wolves by the fruit that they bear. If they have no fruit of the Spirit, they're headed for hell. Majority of the world's going to hell. Y'all do know that, don't you? Not many mighty, not many wise in this world, not many noble are called. Most of the world is going to hell, and they don't believe that. Now, he's, he says that this is, your thinking has been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Let me give you some verses on this corruption. I didn't mean to go to this part here, but go back over here to Ephesians 4. I'm going to come back here. I'm reading some verses to you about what a true preacher goes through. But the false preachers, if you go on down here in chapter 11, verse 4, For he that, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you have received another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, I'm afraid you'll follow this other Jesus, this other spirit, this other gospel. That's what the world is preaching, another Jesus. We're at the end of time. If all these preachers are preaching, they're part of the false prophecy system. Because if we're at the end of time, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, and the false prophet is going to rise to the, 
top of the world scene at the end of time. The false prophet is here. The false prophet is not one man. It's this conglomerate of these nice guy preachers that are corrupting the minds of the people with smooth words. The Bible says your thinking is rotten when you listen to this. Look over here back in Ephesians. I'm going to come back to 2 Corinthians 11. I've been meaning to get back to 2 Corinthians 11. But just quickly to go to Ephesians. Ephesians 4. Now Ephesians 4 is about false doctrine, isn't it? It's about the winds of doctrine down there in verse 14. And men use winds of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. They lie in wait to deceive. The word slight, I've told you, is the word cubia. And cubia is a, it's a word that comes from the word cube. Or we say cube, C-U-B-E. And this has the idea of cubes that are dice. Loaded dice. And they switch the dice on you. And they're using sleight of hand to trick you. And they're talking smooth words to you, and this blinds you, and this makes your thinking rotten. Everything that's true is not hard to understand. When you listen to a smooth-talking false prophet, isn't it kind of hard to understand what they're meaning and what they're saying? Like, what's he trying to say? Are you, is anybody having a hard time understanding what I'm saying tonight? No, no, no hard time understanding it. God's word has to be great plainness of speech. Plainness, parhesia, means blunt to the point. What I'm doing is breaking things down to the lowest common denominator and dividing the words up and breaking down the, the syllables and giving you the construction of the word and saying, hey, here's what it means. Deal with it. And that's what a preacher is supposed to do. You're not supposed to be making your family feel good, your husband or your wife or your brothers or your sisters. It's like, it's like Mr. He says something here in his book on the shadow of the cross. I don't know if I can find it. But he says, I know about where it is. Let me see if I can find it. I mean, he says some words that just stay with me. I mean, for years, and I read this years ago, I've got this particular one marked up. He said there has to be one last, oh yeah, this is it right here. Ah, I like this. Boy, this is good. This is what you have to deal with. Every step of progress and sanctification brings the Christian back to the dreadful battleground where many a tear has been shed and many a drop of blood spilled. If you are in Christ, it is a familiar scene. There before you is the grisly old enemy to spiritual progress. The grisly old enemy of spiritual progress Standing astride the path of obedience to God. Self. That's your grisly old enemy. This monster. Cries out daily to be served. That's hard isn't it? Oh me. He challenges the dominion of Jesus Christ. And opposes every devotion of time, energy, and love to the Lord. But it is a strange war that we may win only by feeling ourselves the painful blows we give. Every denial of self is keenly felt. How we would love to change the scene of combat, wouldn't we? That's our mortal enemy. It's me. But on every occasion when we are serious about advancing in righteousness, we must contend with that enemy, that monster of self. It is to be feared that in many church, many in the church desire 
all their toys for self and revival too. They want all their toys and they want their revival. While many mean, while many moan that God has not rent the heavens and come down, very few deny themselves of food to fast. Self is not denied whole days while, selves, while saints keep not silence. No axe is being laid to the root of self. This is all about self, folks. That's, our, that's the mortal enemy that stands astride our path to righteousness. Is it not time for those who are in earnest about revival to declare a relentless war on self? Not a once for all encounter, but a life devoted to denying self and living every hour unto him who died and rose again. All the great spiritual delights we long for come into the world of the Christian's experience attended with birth pangs of self-denial. More like that, don't y'all? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chantry, for not compromising these words. Now look here in Ephesians. Ephesians, we're talking about your thinking being rotten. What really messes you up? Your thinking, when your thinking is rotten, it is comforted. You have to have a discomfort over the flesh. It's like Mr. Chantry said, self-denial is daily. That discomforts you. Your thinking is rotten as a believer. When you sit back and you relax and say, I'm okay. I accepted Christ. I walked the aisle. I'm home free now. Now, I'll just... I believe this because my preacher said this and my mom and daddy said this and I just don't think they'd lie to me. Your mama isn't a nicer person than my mama. My mama was one of the nicest people in all the world. Nobody, nobody didn't like my mother. But she don't like the truth. She'd get fussy with me and just say very quietly, Now, Jimmy, don't say those things to me. I don't want to hear that. And that's the way she'd say it. That's, just, that's the way she talks. I don't want to hear that, Jimmy. She didn't... I'll tell you who she reminds me of. Her disposition is like my daughter-in-law. She reminds me of my, my daughter-in-law and her are so much alike. As far as disposition, Karen is so quiet, so gentle. Did y'all notice how loud she was at dinner? But Karen loves the truth. Karen is real quiet and gentle, and she can cry real easy and just real gentle. So my mother's like that. But boy, you talk predestination to my mother, and she don't you talk to me about that. I don't want to hear that Christmas. I don't want to hear that, Jimmy. I won't have that. See, you don't have to shout and yell to deny something. You just have to have your thinking rotten. And if if you're not discomforted, if you're comforted, your thinking is rotten. If you're discomforted over the Word of God, you're in good shape. And how many come to me and say, Jim, I just don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm elect. I just don't know. Good. You're supposed to be in that kind of shape. You're supposed to be wrestling with this flesh every day. That's the truth, isn't it? Look here. Ephesians 4. It's amazing to me that I I can find these verses. Do you all know I could start reading the Bible to you? And I could sit here all night tonight and all day tomorrow, and read you one verse after the other that you never hear in churches. So I can read all night long and say, let me show you this, let me show you this, let me show you this, let me show you this. Why is it I can find these verses in a King James Bible and you never hear them read? Much less commented on. Do you? Look here. In Ephesians 4, you see the winds of doctrine in verse 14. And Paul is warning, is Paul, when Paul's writing to the Ephesian church, is he warning vessels of wrath over there that's hanging around the Ephesian church 
the Bible is not, it's not written to vessels of wrath. It's written to the believers. So he's telling the church, it's possible for you to be led away by winds of doctrine and you're thinking to become rotten and you get overcomforted in the flesh. And you know what does that? False doctrine. What is it that makes you comfortable? Comfortable doctrine, doesn't it? I put you at ease. The Lord said in Jeremiah 48, Jeremiah said, Moab is at ease from their youth because they have not been emptied from vessel to vessel. When you took some wine and you made grape juice and you emptied it from one let goat skin bag, which was their bottles, from one bottle to the other, it would filter out the dregs that was in the bottom of the bag. You'd empty it to one, you'd empty it to another, and empty it to another. And those dregs, if you did empty it from vessel to vessel, the dregs would become, make the wine sour, and you couldn't drink it, and it was good for nothing. And if you haven't been emptied from vessel to vessel and gone through tribulation, you are a good for nothing. You say, but I'm too young yet. Somewhere in your life, you must go through tribulation. You must have a daily cross. That includes every young person here. That includes Zach back there. Somewhere Zach has to go. Zach's a sportsman in high school. He's a really good football player. And, but he has to go through it. If he belongs to God. I use Zach because I know he don't mind. He comes to church with Larry and they... Volunteer to clean up the church. But that's, it, that's any young person. You have somewhere in your life, God's got to get a hold of you. And get a hold of your heart. As long as you're comfortable in life, you're in trouble. But if you're a believer, you won't discomfort yourself. God will deal with you to a place where that you will have to become discomforted. And that won't be something you do. It'll be something God does in you. And if he never does that to you, you don't belong to God and you really don't even care what I'm talking about. Did you know that? People don't even care what I am saying if they don't belong to God. Ah, well, that's okay. That guy's a little bit crazy. I'll leave here and I'll go on back home, go back to my a free will church and preacher and my preacher's a nice guy and I'll get to go to heaven with him one day. Well, he ain't going. If you don't tell the truth. Well, he has his truth and you have your truth. You say it a little bit harder than he does. That's not truth when it doesn't discomfort you. We're talking about the difference between false doctrine and true doctrine. False doctrine hurts. Uh, tr true doctrine hurts. False doctrine comforts. One is comfortable, the other is uncomfortable. One makes you feel good and makes you say, I know I'm saved. And the other says, man, I don't know if I'm saved. Man, I don't know. What am I my day that crossed my self-denial? Oh, God. And people come up to me and most of you have come up to me and say, Jim, I just don't think I'm bearing my cross. I don't think I'm making enough people mad. I'd, sometimes I just get out in public. I just can't witness. And I have such a hard time. Fred doesn't have a hard time talking about carpentering. I have a hard time talking about carpentering. You know why I have a hard time about carpentry, talking about talk, being a carpenter? Because I don't know anything about it. Anthony back there, he doesn't have a hard time talking about dentistry and drilling teeth and putting in fillings and crowns because he's a dentist and he knows it. But I don't, to be honest with you, Anthony, I'm not interested in talking to you about dentistry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I really don't care. You know why? Because I don't know anything about it. And you're not going to be interested in talking about God. When you go out in public and you start to witness to people, unless you know something about this book, and folks, let me just I speak foolishly like Paul said there. Bear with me in my folly. Compared to the world, I know a lot about this book. Why do you think I just have to open my mouth when I get into a restaurant? When I get with one of you? But did I know a lot about this when I was 
First time I heard predestination, I was about 20 years ago, old, and a guy quoted Romans 8, 29, and I'd been in church all my life. Did I know a lot then? No. I'd try to witness, and somebody would get me in a corner, and I didn't know what the answers were, and I'd go, oh my God, I don't know. And I'd just, and my heart would pound and beat, and, and boom, 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 when I was going to witness somebody. Does that happen to most of you? Yes. Did you know it never happens to me anymore? You know why? Because I know 999,000 times, 999 million times <laughs> out of 100 million, I usually know more than anybody I run into. And I don't mean that in a boast. I just do. It's kind of like if you're the teacher, if you're a, a fifth grade teacher, are you intimidated when you walk into a fifth grade class by all the questions they're going to ask you? No. You want to know how you witness? Learn all of this book you can. You won't have a problem at all talking about it. Just like Fred doesn't have a problem at all talking about carpentry work. Just like you don't have a problem. Jim will talk to you. He can tell you about driving trucks all over the country and getting in snow banks and, and loses his brakes going down a hill and how you drive down a hill that's got a long grade on it and he'll sit there and get enthused about telling you about it because he's done that for years. And whatever your, whatever your interest is in your heart will come out your mouth. You want to know how to witness? Learn the book. I know you're not going to learn it all at once. And if you will listen to my tapes, you'll learn it. Won't you? I promise you. The average person that comes here, I talked to somebody today. I said, look. He said, it was yesterday today. I said, look, when you come to grace and truth, he was afraid when he come here, a lot of people wouldn't know anything but me. No, you come here and you start talking to people to come to grace and truth. I said, they will shoot this stuff out at you. He was worried about if he come here, well, what if I get there and I don't have any fellowship and nobody is able to help me? And I said, look, you come in here and everybody's learning this stuff all the time. Isn't that true? In order to witness, you have to know something about what you're talking about. Usually, when somebody says some ignorant thing in public, my mind goes, and I got it. Let me see. I got 45 things I can say. I grab one and go to the other and go to the other. That's not hard. When you, I'm trying to tell you how to witness in public. And when I first started, my heart would just pound when I was going to witness somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Oh, goodness, he asked me this question. See, I know what that's about, too. Learn the Word of God. Study it. But let me show you one other thing here. I'm about out of time, ain't I, Mike? Okay, look here. And here in, in 4 and 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation... Conversation doesn't mean just your words. It's the word anastrepho. It means way of life, mode of living. You put off the mode of living, the old man, that's the outer man, which is phthero, rotten. What is the old man? According to deceitful lust, that's the outer man. And you have an inner man and an outer man. But when he's saying put off, it's not a happening that happens one day. It's a constant turning and turning and, and it's putting off every day till the end of your life. You're putting off the old man. Other, and the old man, that's the carnal man. That's the outer man that talks about, Paul talks about in Romans 7. That's the outer man that's carnal. He's fleshly. He is contentious. He's contentious. He's filled with strife. And that's in every one of us. Because when you're a carnal person, you're fleshly. And you think about you. That's what you're thinking about. When you're thinking about you and your career and your life and your car and your house and your marriage, and am I going to get the girl? Am I going to get that guy? Is this going to happen for me? Is this going to happen for me? We don't have to be taking any thought for our life. That's false doctrine. False doctrine and true doctrine boil down 
to comfort and discomfort. That's what it boils down to. Huh? Former means your conversation in your life before. But I just got through explaining conversation. Okay. Anastrepho means mode or method of living. The way you lived was for self before. And the Bible has much to say about. Then there's the word diaphathero. D-I-A. P-H. T-H. E-I-R-O. When you place dia on this word thero, it means to rotten thoroughly, to totally decay. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Though our outward man perish. What is the outward man? The inward man is renewed day by day. There we are, back to the inner and the outer man. Though our outward man perish, is thoroughly rotten, and God says, that outward man that's on the outside of us, that's the fleshly part of us, we're composed of two men. The inner man, which is Christ in you, and the outer man, which is self. And the longer you live, the more you want to die to the flesh. I've talked to Milton. He's 86. He's healthy for an 86-year-old man. He don't look like it when you're walking around with him. He said, I think about dying. Milton knows he doesn't have that much longer to live, and he wants to, li- and he wants to go be with the Lord. I mean, can you imagine 86 years old and all the agony he's been through and all the hassling and all of the- and he's resolved so many things. I resolved a lot at my age. I'm not there yet. But that outward man will become thoroughly rotten and the inward man will be renewed day by day. And the longer we live, the outward man, you know what this is about? The false prophet is anything that appeals to the outward man, the flesh. It's the tree, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And that's what Eve saw in the tree. It's that list of things, but that's the lust of the flesh. Anything that appeals to our flesh. I'm not in people say, well, what am I supposed to do? Quit working? I didn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. You're supposed to do the best work you can do. I've had people talk to me about this on a regular basis. Whatever a hand finds to do, we do it with our might. We do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we do it to the glory of God. And we do not say, tomorrow I'm going to buy and go into such and such a city and buy and sell and get gain. And I'm going to do this tomorrow and then I'm going to get my college education. Then I'm going to go do this. Then I'm going to get this job. I'm going to buy that car. I'm going to buy this house. And then I'm going to get that woman. I'm going to get that guy. And then I'm going to get that ring. And then I'm going to get me a bigger ring. And then I'm going to get me more than that. And then I'm going to get me a boat and a longer boat. And then I'm going to do this for me. And I'm going to do it and go to church and be a good Christian. Does that sound like assaulting that monster that stands in our way, that monster of self? When the Bible speaks of the false prophet, it's talking about nothing except whatever these preachers preach from the serpent in the garden to the end of time that caters to self. There's two doctrines in the Bible. Two is all there is. Death to self. And fulfill self. That's it. So if there's two doctrines. You have to be fulfilling death to self. Fulfilling the flesh. Or fulfilling self. Is the false doctrine. It's always been that. Hasn't it? Sin is the transgression of the law. It transgressed God's law. To go get the tree. That's what it does. Work as hard as you can. If God gives you the ability, like I said this morning, to be a chiropractor like Jim sitting down in front, or to be a dentist like Anthony, or to be a truck driver, whatever you're, and to make whatever money you make, God sets you in life that way. Give God the glory. Work for Him. Don't work to get attention and glory. And learn to stand up to your family, your friends, and take assault on self. What you're doing is preserving self. And when you preserve self... You're following false doctrine. 
This takes effort. It takes, I said this to somebody the other day. When I do the, oh, I was talking to Fred. I said, when I read, I don't read because I feel like reading all the time, and all readers know that. You read to find out what the information is. And a lot of times I set myself down and I say, hey, you go sit down and read. And I make myself read when I'd rather do something else. I make myself do it. And sometimes I read a paragraph and I don't remember a thing I read. I say, let me go in here and get where it's quieter. And I force myself to read it again and go a lot slower and get where it's quiet. That's the same thing as self-denial, isn't it? You have to learn to force yourself to do what you're supposed to do. It's kind of like going to college. If you don't force yourself to stay in the dorm and study instead of going and partying, you're going to flunk out. If you don't force yourself to do what you're supposed to do with God, you're just going to enter in by the skin of your teeth, even so as by fire. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for truth. Help us to understand that this false teacher, this false prophet out here, would seduce us all if it were possible, but we are the elect. It cannot seduce us. Lord, sometimes it's so hard to wake up to this. The world is asleep. We know that. You have put them into a drowsy state, and they're stumbling around. One of these days, Lord, you're going to drop a bomb on this nation. Lord, it may be literal through the hands of evil men, but you're going to drop something upon this world to awaken the elect. Even so, come Lord Jesus, in Christ's name we pray, amen.